Good evening, everyone who's in, in attendance here in chambers and online. Just giving you a quick update. The council has wrapped up their closed session and will be taking a 10 minute recess. So they shall be out here about 7:10. Thank you for your patience.
Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much to the public session. Uh, we just came back from closed session. And I'd like to uh, have a call to order and go to our Pledge of Allegiance and Statement of Values. So if we can all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and then remain standing afterwards for the Code of Conduct. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Remain standing for the... As we gather, we humbly seek blessings upon this meeting. May we act with strength, courage, and will to perform our obligations and duties to our people with justice to all. Let us seek wisdom so that we may act in the best interest of our people, our neighbors, and our country. All this we ask so that we may serve our community with fairness and respect, putting their needs before all. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to read. Vice, Vice Mayor Park, I have um, an announcement to make. Okay. Um, during the time that you were in closed session, um, and due to the heavy winds this evening, there have been many power outages throughout the city, and we ourselves here in Chambers had a blip. Um, so we've had to reboot the system in here. So if there are any glitches, we ask you to please bear with us and let us know. Um, if it goes out again, well, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Um, now I will read the announcements. Yes. AB 23, members of the Santa Clara Stadium Authority, Sports and Open Space Authority, and Housing Authority are entitled to receive $30 for each attended meeting. Statement of Behavioral Standards, the City of Santa Clara has adopted a code of ethics and values and behavioral standards for public meetings to promote and maintain the highest levels of conduct. This includes mutual respect, robust discussion, and allowing city business to be done in an efficient and consistent manner. Please note that as the presiding officer, the vice mayor, vice chair's direction in matters of process and decorum should be followed and that use of the gavel indicates all conversations must conclude and everyone in attendance should come to order and attention. Welcome and thank you for your participation. For those registered lobbyists that are attending this evening, we ask you to please identify yourself as such and disclose your clients and or organizations that you represent. This is pursuant to city code section 2.155.110. Thank you. I'm going to read the opening comments for our hybrid meetings. Uh, good evening, everyone. For today's meeting, the council is back in person and is conducting its meeting in a hybrid manner. The public is welcome to attend in person, and the city continues to use a Zoom feature to allow participation from the safety of your own home or office. Members of the public can still join via the link or can call into the Zoom meeting phone number shown on the screen. That's there. Uh, if you'd like to speak an agenda item or during public presentations, please raise your hand on the Zoom application or press star nine on your phone. Please only raise your hand while the item you're speak seeking to speak on is presented. Staff will enter your name, last four digits, your phone number, or, and I will call on you to speak. As a friendly reminder, members of the public have two minutes to speak on an agenda item and three minutes on public presentation, reserved for topics not on the agenda. Prior to each agenda item, staff will lower your hand to ensure members of the public are seeking to speak on the appropriate agenda item. Thank you very much, and let's move on to the council agenda. Vice Mayor Park, if I may. Yes. Um, just for those that are probably joining us now and that were not here during a roll call, just a reminder that the mayor um, is absent this evening and that Council Member Watanabe is remote, and she is remote under AB 2449 under Just Cause. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, that brings us to uh, reports of action taken in closed session matters. And I believe that we had a change to the closed session. We had a def um, item 1E deferred. I don't know if the city attorney wants to make that statement or if I just have to announce that. I think you just did, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Yes. Uh, with respect to the rest of the agenda, uh, there is no reportable action. I can't speak for item 1A, however. Understood. So just to be clear, item 1E, which was a conference with legal counsel existing litigation pursuant to Government Code 54956.9D1, Bloon Energy Corporation et al. versus City of Santa Clara et al. has been deferred until the 7th of March meeting. And we do have a, we do have something to report from item 1A. Um, on item 1A, council has decided to take no action on the appointment of an interim city manager. 
The existing staff in the city manager's office will continue to perform their duties in anticipation of Mr. Grogan's May 1st start date, consistent with their existing authority to do so. Council would determine whether further action is necessary. Thank you. Okay, it takes us to continuances, exceptions, and reconsiderations. We do have an uh, exception for item eight. I believe that item eight, which is uh, an 030 request, is being withdrawn by the applicant. So the action on a written petition uh, submitted by Laurel Anderson requesting a to place an agenda, an agenda item on the future council meeting for council to discuss approval of a dog park at Earl Carmichael Park on Penden Street has, um, has been removed from the agenda by the, by as from the request of the applicant. Are there any other continuances, exceptions, or reconsiderations from the public? Okay. My hand is raised. Okay. Uh, council member Watanabe. Thank you. Yes, I would like to uh, make a motion to continue item number five to uh, the next meeting when the mayor will be present. Okay, so we have a request, a motion to move item number five, which is uh, action on appointment to Cities Association of Santa Clara County Board of Directors, alternate member for the 2023 calendar year. So we have a motion to defer this to the next council meeting by council member Watanabe. I'll second that. A second by council member Jane. <clears throat> Are there any comments or discussion on that motion? Seeing none, I will go to ask for the roll call vote. So the maker of the motion is the motion to move item number five until the mayor is back or to March 7th? Until the mayor is back. Okay, so I have continue item five until the mayor is back, which could be March 7th, but. Okay. Council member Watanabe. Yes. Council member Shahal. Yes. Council member Hardy. Yes. Council member Park. Yes. I mean, Vice Mayor Park. Uh, Council member Jane. Yes. Councilmember Becker? Yes. Thank you. That item passes. Um, six are, to one. Six to one. Are there any other, any other exceptions, reconsiderations? Seeing none, that takes us to the special order of business. And uh, this evening we have, our, we have one special order of business. Uh, we are honored to recognize the Wilcox High, High School Robotics Team Who's here? The Wilcox High School Robotics Team, number 8872, known as Robopocalypse, won two of the most prestigious awards at the Stratford Preparatory School first Tech Challenge event on January 22nd. And I could tell you more about the team and I can tell you more about their accomplishments, but we have their coaches here. We've got Councilmember Jane and Councilmember Hardy. And rather than me go on and on about them, I'll, I'll let them uh, speak for, for the team. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, we are extremely proud of our team, 8872 Robo Apocalypse. We have another team, a junior team, Roblivion. But uh, as uh, Vice Mayor Park said, they won five out of five qualifier matches. They were the only team to do that. And then when they got to the finals, they dominated the finals. Semi-final match two, they won by 195 to 21. The finals match one, they won by 192 to 65, so they dominated the, the finals. They did win the, uh, the full competition. They were the Alliance captain and they won the finals. Um, and then they went on to win the most prestigious award at a co robotics competition, and that's the Inspire Award. And they really demonstrated the guiding principle behind First Robotics, which is gracious professionalism. One of the neighboring teams, the Wolves, they didn't have their controller with them. We loaned them a controller. Another team from Berkeley, the Robohawks, they were having trouble running their software, so Yotam went over there and helped them with their, with their software. 
So we really did demonstrate the principle, which is you help each other perform the best at the, at the tournaments. And so um, I have a little video here of, of, I don't know what happened to it. It's a two and a half minute match. The first 30 seconds are autonomous. You just press the button and the robot does everything by itself. And we, did, we had a perfect autonomous. They have, to, they have to pick up those cones and put them on those poles. And our, our robot is the one in front here, near the audience. This is all auto autonomous, no human intervention. Now they pick up their controllers and they drive it through joysticks. And with that, the driver control career begins. 99 going for those substation cones. Nice and You can see we're we're putting more cones on faster than anybody else. So far we haven't seen a circuit. Maybe the final flash is the one. Fourth cone. Sadly they missed it. Still have three on there. Cyber Wizard, another cone. Put it on that low. Meanwhile, nice and nine with that high jump shoot score. This is where we actually get stuck on our encoder. So we've stacked enough cones that we're going to win, but we actually get stuck and can't move. Okay, that's the match. Yeah. So. Um, I'm extremely proud of our team. Um, they 3D printed, they learned a lot of tools. They did the CAD design, they 3D printed things. They used a CNC mill to cut out the, the, the aluminum to make the robot. And why don't you guys come up here and show us the robot. And, uh, and I just wanted to say, uh, we're really appreciative of Wilcox High School for providing us with a room. And then uh, I wanted to say something about the sponsors. Ms. Hardy actually gets all our sponsors. And here's our sponsors in case you want to list them. I will tell you that since Jane and I started this team in 2014, we're extremely proud of this year. Each year there is a different challenge. And they have definitely rose to the challenge this year. This is a student-built machine. And uh, also, I always worry, we do let them use power tools. And everyone still has all their fingers and toes and eyes, which parents, that's very important. So the sponsors we have, we're so thrilled that have helped us. KLA, Northrop Grumman, O2 Micro, TMK Manufacturing, and Santa Clara Rotary, Lockheed Martin, and Intuitive Surgical have all helped us out throughout the years and made this possible. The school gives us the room, but all the parts, all the, all the, all the things that we need to pay for, even the food that a bunch of teenagers will eat at a tournament, and trust me, they will eat. And so we are very pleased that at one tournament that they won both of the, the highest awards possible at that tournament, and they will be going to the regional 
uh, tournament, which will be held at McDonald High on March 4th. And then all those tournament... It's March 5th. ...will be March 5th, Sunday, March 5th. If anyone would like to go watch there in the new gymnasium, there is no charge to that. But we're very, very proud of them. The matches will start at... The, the matches will start at about 10 a.m. and go till 4 p.m. So anybody is, it's all free. Come watch, watch us and root for us as we compete in the regional tournament. Okay, we have Councilmember Chahal who would like to make a comment. Thank you, Vice Mayor. <clears throat> so uh, kudos to all the uh, team members over here who are standing over here and maybe if somebody is missing, you deserve a big hand. And I also want to point out, I was at one of the tournaments that Will Cox joined uh, for one hour or two hours. I want to commend two of the gentlemen sitting on this dais, like Serge Chain and uh, Councilmember Hardy. Councilmember Hardy, not Teacher Hardy today. <laughs> so because they put in so much time and effort into this thing, and uh, it's commendable. Like if I ask them to do something, they say, oh, let me check the a robotic schedule, then they commit to me, oh, I will be okay. So uh, as a team, I want to commend all of you as well as your coaches who have done such a tremendous work for you. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Councilman, Councilman Becker. Councilman Becker. Thank you, Vice Mayor. So uh, congratulations. Uh, enjoy these moments. Um, I got to say, you know, looking back, uh, I wish I had this opportunity that you guys had. Uh, not long ago, I was in high school too, but this is a great opportunity that you guys have. And when I hear what Councilmember Hardy and uh, Councilmember Jane have been helping you guys with and 3D printers, I'm going, where was all this when I was your age? So congratulations. I'm really looking forward to what you guys can do. And I think you guys are gonna go far in your future because you know the future is AI and the future is robotics. So I really look, I can't look, wait to see where you guys go. Thank you. And, and I know that when you're in competition or just giving demonstrations, the, the fatal words, the last words, famous last words are, watch this. But I also know that any time you've got something on, on video that's a problem or something goes wrong, my response is, that's how you know it's real, right? That's how you know it wasn't a, a doctored video. And I congratulate all of you. I'd like to, again, uh, deepest appreciation, congratulations to the team, to Councilmember Jane, to Councilmember Hardy, and I'd like you to join me below for a commendation to the Wilcox High School team, Robopocalypse, and I invite the council to join me as well. And we've got individual awards for everyone as, as well.
All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for all the uh, great comments. Um, so I'm Alexander Cameron. I'm the captain of the Wilcox High School robotics team. And I'm going to tell you guys a little bit more about what we do. So uh, we participate, as Sud said, in an international competition known as FTC, which stands for the First Tech Challenge. And in part of that, there's uh, essentially two things we need to do. One is build a robot like this to dominate on the, on the field. And two is actually to do something called outreach. And for us, that really means reaching out to our local community and helping them out. So one way we've done this is over the past year, we have reached out to countries such as Mauritius, Ghana, Jordan, Thailand. And we've given hour long uh, seminars where we've taught them about robotics, and engineering and really just gotten them interested in that so that they'll have uh, engineering in their lives in the future. And in addition, we've also have, a, have had a large local presence. I know many of you guys know Peterson Middle School. We've actually started a robotics team there that participates in FLL and we, uh, we visit there twice a week to make sure that they're learning and that they will be successful engineers in the future. So all these things that we do really help embody gracious professionalism and help us uh, um, win the Inspire Award as well. Um, and then onto the bot, as you can see here, hopefully in front of us, we have three major parts of the robot. We have a drivetrain, we have a double reverse four bar, as it's called, or a lift, and we have an arm on the top. And in conjunction, these three devices allow us to score quickly and efficiently on the high junction, mid junction, or low junction of the field. And I know a lot of you guys are engineers here, and I I'm sure you know that, well, everything works on the first try. Not. Of course not. So uh, we've actually been through many iterations of this robot, and we've really just optimized and iterated it over, the, you know, over months and months of work to arrive at a design that is perfect. So yeah, thank you. microphone. Hey, we'd like to give these out and as each one of the students comes up, Alexander, come on down. Yo Tom. Yo Tom Duvenet. Melvin. Remind me how to say your last name. Gwen. Melvin went, mostly I just yell at him and say, move it. <laughs> oh, did I say that out loud? Thank you. Uh, we have three that are not here. That's Jason Fisher. Um, Andrew's here. Abriana Lee and Min Song and Min Song Khan. So we'll make certain we get those to them. But Navneeth, Krishna. There you go. Melvin Matthew. Katie Zinn. I can't say her Chinese name right correctly, but she loves me anyway. Brian Wang. Smart Mangala. Did I say it right? Good. Ian Cyan. Sayed, yay. Andrew K. Wilcox Robotics, yay. Yes. 
So again, Councilmember Jane, Councilmember Hardy, thank you very much for that, and thank you very much for the Wilcox Robotics team. Uh, I want to give them one, one, one more hand. Thank you. Get, the, get that robot ready for regionals. That's all I'm going to say. So that takes us to our consent calendar. Um, items listed on the consent calendar are considered routine and will be adopted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of the items on the consent calendar unless discussion is requested by a member of the council, staff, or public. If so requested, that item will be removed from the cons consent calendar and considered under consent items pulled for discussion. Are there any, any items for, to be pulled from the consent calendar? Council uh, member. Yes, James. Vice Mayor. I would like to pull item 3K. That's uh, the schematic design of the mini park at Calle de, del Mundo. Okay, we have a uh, pulling 3K. Are there any other items to be pulled? I'll motion the remaining balance. Okay, so we have a motion. I second. A second by Council Member Chahal. Council Member, Board Member Watanabe? Yes. Council Member, Board Member Chahal? Yes. Council Member, Board Member Hardy? Yes. Vice Mayor, Vice Chair Park? Yes. Council Member, Board Member Jane? Yes. Council Member, Board Member Becker? Yes. Thank you. And that passes unanimously. Which takes us to um, item six, as item five was, was moved to the next meeting that the mayor. Public. Oh, sorry. Public oh, you're right, public presentations. Just reading the headings. To take us to public presentations, this item is reserved for persons to address the council or authorities on, a matter, on any matter not on the agenda that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city or authorities. The law does not permit action on or extended discussion of any item not on the agenda except under special circumstances. The governing body or staff may briefly respond to statements made or questions posed and the appropriate body may request staff to report back at a subsequent meeting. Although not required, please submit to the city clerk your name and subject matter on the speaker card available in the council chambers. I believe that we have one you have item. Two. We have two. I see we have Kirk Vartan, special advisor to the mayor. Okay, you have three minutes. Thank you. Full screen. There you go. Uh, good evening, Vice Mayor and Council. Um, in response to Kirk Bartan, um, who was a self proclaimed assistant or advisor to Mayor Lisa Gilmore. And this next video you'll see on the right hand side is the stock Santa Clara video stream. On the left is my current video rig side by side and time synced. Thank you. We should buzz. We should buzz. Thank you very much. Um, special advisor to the mayor. I feel very special. Um, and this next one, same time sync. I also note that there were a lot of book, book events at elementary schools, and I see that the uh, special advisor to the mayor is here. I really appreciated the thought that you, you put in uh, to getting books for the council members. Well, not to the people in particular, but to the seats. And I found a book um, that I thought would entertain the position of special advisor to the mayor, both now and whoever may take the role in the future. Um, it's a book that's seriously called All My Friends Are Dead. But that seems a little, 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 little dark. So I changed it. I have all these uh, post-it notes. It says, all my friends are termed out. And I thought that this would be good. You see, it says, you know, it's kind of fun. It starts with all my friends are termed out. 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 
Most of my friends are termed out. What? Oh, now all my friends are termed out. And all my friends are end tables. I mean, that's a tree talking. Um, so I would like to keep this uh, for the office of special advisor to the mayor. Um, and uh, Dr. Tom Shanks responding. It, it's a short period of, um, of uh, video, but it is one of the most egregious violations of the ethics code that I've seen in any city in the last 30 years. There's no uh, reason ever for somebody to attack a public person from the dais. Uh, that's, that's one thing. It violates every single one of the city's uh, core values. Uh, and the fact that, that Councilmember Becker is laughing at this means he's understanding exactly what's going on. And he thinks it's uh, funny. And it's not. It's inappropriate and it is egregious uh, for the behavior of a council member. This is not role model behavior, which is what everyone has the right to expect from the council. And so no one spoke up, as in you know, the council members nor the city attorney. And I will just let Dr. Tom Shanks bring it home. And one of the problems here is it puts a chilling effect on somebody who's going to get up in front of that council and speak. Thank you. OK, so we've got Jared Peters. Hey, folks, uh, I just wanted to follow up uh, what Kurt just presented there and comment on the situation. Um, regrettably, this was pretty embarrassing and an unfortunate event. Uh, elected council member using city time to personally demean a member of the community is it's unacceptable. OK, um, it's ill conceived dialogue. It wasn't a joke. OK, it was premeditated. It's a juvenile stunt, and it targeted an individual sitting in the audience here. Um, let's imagine for a moment you work in high tech, that you pull the same stunt at work. Okay? You were targeting a colleague or an employee, you thought it was a joke. Um, would your peers stand idly by and, and just watch what, what happened? Would management turn a blind eye to it? Okay? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> that you'd be held accountable and you would be uh, likely having a long conversation with your HR department, okay? Um, the same rules apply here as they do in our, our daily work efforts, our environments. Um, once you take a seat on that dais, you're, you're held to a higher standard, okay? Um, you've been elected to conduct city business. You're expected to act professionally and not use your position of power to carry out a per personal vendetta, okay? The other council members in attendance that night, you, you have a responsibility to uphold this higher standard, okay? Your, your silence is complicit in the actions that took place. <laughs> Based on the previous council meetings and prior to Kurt standing up here, there's been a history of disrespectful comments to members of the community. It needs to stop, okay guys? I think an apology is, is in order here. Thank you. Councilmember Becker has his hand up as well. Yeah, I find it kind of ironic that weekly we have somebody coming in here known as the mayor's special advisor with somebody who says that they're an ethics uh, a specialist when in fact that these peop individuals never interviewed me or never talked to me during any entire process during any of the elections, and in fact, said things that were never true. So I find it kind of ironic that they come in here and acting like victims when actually they are the entire bullies that continually bully me and other members of this city council. So I think it's harassment. And Mr. Vartan, I know you have your camera right here pointed at me because you think you're going to catch something. Good luck. Because you know, we're all ethical up here and we're trying to do the right thing, but you and Mr. Shanks over here like to go and tell the public that things are going wrong and that we're doing the wrong thing. And frankly, that's libel. Frankly, what you guys are saying is lies to the community. I mean, you guys could have your YouTube channel like Alex Jones' channel on, you know, uh, InfoWars, but it doesn't make any difference. Yeah, so 
I would just like to uh, remind the council and the public that the law does not permit action on or extended discussion of any item not on the agenda except under special circumstances. I understand that, but I, I think that constitutionally, I have a right to freedom of speech, and for somebody that calls me out and says that what, that what was done was inappropriate, I'm sorry, but if somebody says something and it's funny and you try not to laugh, it's kind of hard not to laugh. And frankly, the book has a point. All of your friends are termed out. Thank you very much. And we have another member of the public in line. Um, hello, council members. Um, I watched last week's meeting, um, and I was prompted to come tonight. In recent months and around the election, Mr. Vartan started sending me private messages, multiple private messages, tagging me on Facebook and in LinkedIn, sending messages through both those channels. There have been a constant barrage of messages and this left me feeling unsafe and concerned enough that last week after yet another couple messages, I took the decision to block him on social media. I understand he is a special advisor to the mayor. I would like, I'm afraid he is acting on behalf of the mayor, which makes me fearful. And if you can see, I'm shaking. How does he get to be a special advisor to the mayor? And I fear this gives me more say, gives him more say in rights than I have, rather than residents. Is his way of reaching out to me something the mayor has asked him to do as a special advisor? With the recent badgering by him, I am high worry that maybe he is doing the same to others in the community. So as a result, I'm here today or tonight to ask for help and ask what can be done and who can I go to about my concerns. I do feel bullied, harassed, and I really don't like even private videos here. We have the council members being videoed by the city. I fi find it disagreeous as well. And I would like that to be considered. Thank you very much. I'm not stating my name for obvious reasons, and I don't wish to be publicised. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Are there any other comments? OK, and at some point, I would like staff to look into the title of special advisor to the mayor. I understand that this is a not an official title. It is a. Um, granted title, but um, if people do feel that people have been given more privileges than others, then I would like kind of a report on that and other types of granted titles like this. Thank you. Vice Mayor, Kathy, Council Member Watanabe's hand is up. I see. Council Member Watanabe. Thank you. Um, it was unfortunate that I broke my humorous bone uh, on the morning of February 7th and was not able to be in attendance at the meeting that evening. Um, but because if I were, I would have spoken up after what the egregious behavior by a member of this council and the action taken against a member of the public, no matter how you may feel about that person, because you are sitting in that seat, covering for the mayor does not give you the right to try to intimidate or bully that individual. If you have an issue with them, settle it off the dais. The dais is not the place to uh, expand on your issues with somebody that you may not like. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, that takes us to consent items pulled for discussion. I believe we have one consent item, which is 3K pulled by Councilmember Jane. And I believe that we have um, Jim. Yeah, I, I just had a question. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Tasman East project was 45 acres, we were gonna put 100 acres, 100 units per acre there. That was gonna be 45 
hundred units. That has now been expanded to 6,000 units. We had a discussion here in the council about adding parkland. And um, uh, my comment is just basically that with 6,000 units, we're gonna have roughly 15,000 residents there and there is no place for them to garden. There has been no consideration for community gardens anywhere in the Tasman East specific area plan. And uh, while this mini park is probably too small to put a community garden, but I think when I look at the, uh, the waiting list and the backlog of the other community gardens in the Bay Area, uh, there's a need for people to be able to plant something, show their kids how food grows and such. And uh, I would like the city to, uh, I know we're adding extra parkland there, but to consider adding community gardens in dense areas like this where we have 15,000 residents. Similarly for Patrick Henry, um, that would be another uh, amenity to add there. Maybe we could, if we're short of land, we could add it to the rooftops of some of the buildings. But I just wanted to understand uh, uh, what the thought process of is to expand community gardens in the city. And I'm told that uh, Jim Teixeira, I'm assuming, would, would uh, talk on this issue. Uh, yes, good evening. Jim Teixeira, Director of Parks and Recreation, City of Santa Clara. If I understand the, the question directly. It's about how, do we, uh, how are we going about expanding community gardens throughout the City of Santa Clara. Uh, within the, uh, as new residential development does occur in the city, uh, new residential development is required to comply with 1735 of the city code, uh, which is uh, development, acquisition development of new parkland. If they are not uh, dedicating sufficient parkland to meet 2.6 to 3 acres of parkland per 1,000 new resident, then they're required to pay a fee in lieu of that parkland dedication. So there are two methods for delivery of new community gardens as well as other recreational facilities. Uh, community gardens uh, are uh, uh, eligible for uh, either they can dedicate that as a, as a private amenity for their actual residents within a uh, apartment block or community, uh, or they could uh, make it as a recommendation as new parkland that they would be uh, dedicating. I'll give one example of a potential opportunity, uh, which is in the uh, Kiley uh, uh, development. Uh, they're currently, in fact, just tonight, uh, they initiated public input process for new parkland, about 10 acres uh, uh, in that, uh, in the Kylie development area. Uh, and one of the park elements that uh, residents or uh, community could request to be included in that 10 and a half acres would be a new community garden. Uh, currently, we have Eddie Sousa Community uh, Garden. We also have in Lawrence Station, uh, area, we do have uh, a new community garden there. So it is something that we are uh, actively uh, pursuing. The third thing that I would make a recommendation is um, rather than just individual proposals, we are looking for new community gardens. We're also looking at a, a park master plan for throughout the city. So as new residential housing is coming on board, how can we co-locate uh, parks and recreational features near those uh, residents. So that park master plan would help identify opportunities and locations uh, in the new specific plan areas as well as other areas as they are redeveloped within the city. Okay, um, my second question was when I looked at the design of this particular park, it was kind of sterile in terms of it has a dining, a dining area and it has a community room, um, but there's not, not really any uh, like artwork there or, you know, uh, things for kids, little kids to do. So in the, uh, there are two uh, public parcels that are coming online at, at different times that become one integrated uh, park design. Council, it's uh, one, uh, parcel A has already gone through that uh, public input process and approval process by 
commission and, and city council. Uh, so there's an off-leash dog area, there's parkways, there's a barbecue area, um, and then in the additional uh, park space, park parcel B, which is in front of you tonight, is the community room, the public restroom, uh, uh, open grass area, play area, patank courts. Uh, so as an integrated whole on, on uh, less than, uh, what is it, two-tenths of, a, of an acre of, a, of what we would call a mini park, there is a substantial amount going on in, in, in that very small space. Uh, again, public artwork or aesthetic features, we do have some design elements that do uh, help the park uh, pop. Uh, some of those would be the... Uh, uh, lan tree lanterns, there's a hammock and swing area, there's uh, decorative uh, uh, um, concrete work at the front uh, as an entry statement. There's uh, use of specimen trees and those things to bring some aesthetic into uh, the park design. If uh, it's desired to add additional uh, artwork and those sorts of things into the design, that certainly could be a recommendation. Um, it would be one of those higher cost items, usually the artwork and things for, we do have to do a call for artists and uh, perhaps put it in at a later date. So I know we don't have a public art fee or anything. That money would come from the parks department or from general fund or where would it come to add, say a sculpture or something? Uh, generally the, the uh, in lieu fees do not cover uh, artwork or art items. Mm -hmm. They do cover, you know, aesthetic things that you do find in a, uh, uh, a public uh, park. So they could be used for things uh, uh, of that. Um, currently we don't, we're not specifying that. Could come from there, could come from general fund, could come from donations. Um, okay. Well, I'd like to make a motion to approve the proposed schematic design unless there's, okay, sorry. Go ahead. I have a motion to second. I, I also know that uh, Councilmember Hardy has had her hand up. I don't know if it's for this item or a different item. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my question is on the second slide of our, uh, what's in our packet over this, I was a little confused because it says background park location and it shows Calle de Mundo between um, Great America, the station there between um, Lafayette and Guadalupe River, but it references Patrick Henry Drive specific plan. I'll call that out and raise my hand and say there was an error in the, in the slide. Okay. Um, and we do have a corrected version that will be provided as post uh, meeting material. So we did call that out. My apologies to you. Uh, it confused me as well when I was looking at them and thinking, wait a minute, that seems wrong. And it was. Thank you for calling. That's why out. I wanted to, I, it got pulled before I was going to do it, but I was confused and did not want to put that confusing out to the residents. Thank you. So you're gonna pull that slide or just change it so it says It'll the correct? It'll be post, I'll defer to the clerk, but I believe okay. it's post agenda material and it's listed as such and it goes out with it. But Thank that will you. be the park master plan uh, that is uh, approved. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for that. Are there any other comments or questions about this, this issue? Seeing none, I will call the question. Councilmember Watanabe? Yes. Councilmember Shahal? Yes. Councilmember Hardy? Yes. Vice Mayor Park? Yes. Councilmember Jane? Yes. Councilmember Becker? Yes. That passes six, six, to, six to nothing. It doesn't show the absence. Yes. Uh, which takes us to our public hearing and general business. And the first item, item five, was, was deferred by Councilmember Watanabe, which takes us to item six, which is public hearing, adoption of a resolution ordering the abatement of a nuisance consisting of growing weeds in association with the county weed abatement program for 2022 to 2023. Fire Marshal Jake Tomlin here. 
Good evening, Vice Mayor and Council, Jake Tomlin, Fire Marshal for your Fire Department. Uh, we don't have a presentation for you this evening, but I'm available as well as our uh, contractor, Santa Clara County's weed abatement manager, Mo Kumre, who's on the Zoom link, if you have any questions or if there's any questions from the public. Okay. Okay. And uh, we have Council Member Hardy with her hand up. Thank you. Um, I noticed on here that there were over 52 uh, properties that were owner occupied. And I was wondering then, what is the time notification and the criteria that you used? Because that was not clear in the report. What criteria put someone on the weed, weed abatement? And what kind of time frame did you have? Because having that many, where, I understand where we have homeowners or property owners that are out of state and things like that, that there is a process, but I was surprised to see this the many. Upon this mean. May we act with strength food? Okay. I was wondering if it was just the voices in my head or something. So great question, Councilwoman Hardy. Uh, so all the, the parcels that you see on the list uh, for 2023 were actually cited last year in 2022. Uh, so obviously there may be homeowners that uh, are away or ill or have a, a disability that prevents them from uh, keeping their uh, landscape in compliance with uh, the city and county regulations. Uh, and there's basically an appeals process for that. So the, the weed abatement manager that I referenced earlier, Mo Kumre, who runs the program, is very accommodating to people. Uh, I know there were three people that came to the clerk's office uh, when the agenda item was uh, heard for weeds one, uh, and he worked out a mutual agreeable situation with all three of those. One had uh, uh, removed all their landscape, uh, decorative lawn specifically, uh, in, a conform uh, in a conformance with the county standards. So they were removed from the commencement list, and then he agreed to have two other people that were concerned that one had COVID, another one had a husband and um, son that has a disability. Uh, and she couldn't afford to hire a contractor to mow her lawn at that time. Uh, and all three of those have been accommodated through that process. Uh, if there are people that do not have the ability to do it, our firefighter union, 1171, has a program that over the years, typically one to three parcels a year, uh, that they, they take care of uh, when the residents come out and specifically uh, show that they have a need. Thank you. Thank you. I, you didn't answer the other question. What is the criteria that would put someone on that list in so, general? So the, um, there is a uh, county flyer, uh, but typically most of the, the criteria is that if they have weeds uh, or brush that is over six inches in height. Uh, they, and also if their trees are hanging over their, their chimney, uh, they have needles in their gutters and on their roof that pose a fire hazard. Those are the three main things that we see uh, here in the city. Obviously, uh, the County of Vito Bay Program does the entire county, uh, 13 jurisdictions. So uh, they disc uh, down in Gilroy, hundreds of acres of a property, but here uh, in the city, it's mainly just those three items. We have Councilmember Becker. Sorry, yeah, I was going to make a motion, but I realize it's a public hearing, so I'll go to the public first. Public hearing. So if you'd like to make a comment on this agenda item, uh, which is item six, public hearing, adoption of resolution ordering the abatement of a nuisance consisting of growing weeds in association with the county weed abatement program for 2022-23, uh, please raise your hand on the Zoom application or press star nine on your phone. We will call on you to speak after the council questions and comments. And Vice Mayor, uh, I want you to make sure you're, you're uh, formally opening uh, the public hearing. I see. So do we have a motion to formally open the public hearing? Oh, we just did. I just opened. Okay. That's right. So I'd, I don't see any comments from... We have one right here. Yes. Would you please come to the podium? Uh, I'm nervous. 
That's okay. Okay. We have I am one of the homeowners that he was talking about. I talked to uh, Mo this morning. I talked to a lady from your fire department over here uh, last month and this month. And what happened last year, I had went to my out on the first week in March. I mowed the front yard. There was two sections. I didn't have time to do that day. I have a disabled daughter and a husband in a nursing home, and I'm probably the one that said didn't have the money to hire somebody to do it, because <laughs> I said that a lot. And I took some pictures today, and I can show you guys what they saw in the picture they took last year. Last year, it, the picture was taken from across the street, so the whole house, and right in front of, by the sidewalk, I have fl uh, flower, um, I don't know what they're called. Uh, in, in the past, they called them uh, naked ladies because in the wintertime, they come up and they're completely, uh, they're green leaves that come up, which is higher than the six inches or whatever it is that um, they require you to be under. And between each of them, it's, it's um, my, between there, each of the bushes, there is uh, weeds that grow up during the winter time. And that particular day, I had done it. Oh. Yeah, if you can, okay. if you can finish, if you can finish your presentation, um, I'll let you finish. But can we? You know, okay. Just I took pictures. Not, not too of long. They took pic a picture of last year, but this is a picture of them with no weeds in there. And if you were across the street where they took the picture from, he sent them to me today so I could see them. It does look like. The whole yard is full of high weeds. But if he had taken the picture from the sidewalk, he would have seen that the grasp on the backside, the, the main part of the uh, yard, had been mowed down the previous week. And I went out to uh, finish it up a few days after that which I didn't know somebody, I did have no idea that you guys had a, a problem with things grow, growing up in, in the front yard. And I've been there for 44 years and never had a problem. And I have pictures showing that these plants that go around, across the front of the yard, how they look without the weeds that grow up in front of it. And the day I got the letter last year uh, from the city saying that they put me on some kind of a weed list. And they said I'd have to come over here today and ask to be have my name taken off of it because I didn't have the time to get out there and do the whole thing at that time. And the only way to get them down would be use a weed whacker or do it by hand. And at that time, I was using a, um, a lawn mower for the yard. And another day, when I went out to finish it, a few days after the fellow had took the picture, which I didn't know he did, um, my mailman came and handed me my mail. And in that mail was a letter from you guys saying I was putting on, on this list. I ended up that day going to Kaiser Hospital. I had an anxiety attack because of this letter coming. And I said it was very unfair how you guys go, go about doing that because after 44 years of living in Santa Clara, I had no idea that you had a thing that where you, you have to have everything mowed down by the 1st of March. 
And I'd like to be taken off that list. And I want to show him the, these pictures if I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Are there any other comments? Any comments from the public? <clears throat> Council Member Becker? Motion. Uh, wait, There's we have, a, sorry, we sorry, have one we more. Have somebody else. Somebody else. Please come up, sir. Wait, or do we? Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm new to this whole cycle. My name is Kedia al Himeri. I reside in 2382 Warburton Avenue. I got this letter and the list. Can someone explain the dynamics of it and what we need to do uh, as far as this goes? And is this something is going to be listed for the next year or three years or whatever to be under the radar screen? Just to enlighten us, at least I'm, I'm new to all this uh, actually. Thank you. Understood. I don't know if you can come up and answer that Mo, question really Mo quickly. Mo has his hand up, Vice Mayor. Who does? The county. I see. Abatement officer. Yeah, can you put them on, please? I don't see. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So it, it would be to put the property on the list for three consecutive years of voluntary compliance, and then it comes off automatically. Uh, the first speaker that spoke, we've already made an arrangement that if the property passes the inspection, it comes off the program at no cost to the property owner. So that's already been an agreed upon item. For the second property, um, when we find a property to be non-compliant, we go through this process. Uh, you make the ruling and then we will monitor the property for three consecutive years if it passes those inspections. They're dismissed after that, and no additional fees would be charged. Okay. If the property owner needs uh, guidance, they can contact my office, and we would be happy to have someone come out and tell them exactly what needs to be done. Thank you very much. So it sounds like um, if you've been cited, then we would monitor the property for three consecutive years. And after three consecutive years of no more uh, weed problems, you would be taken off with no additional citations. Uh, I see that. Well, they receive an inspection fee each year for the county services because they're 100% cost recovery for their program. So each year that they're in the program, they would receive that, uh, I think it's $91. Mel, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, $91. So they would be charged the maintenance, the, the inspection fee for each year for the three consecutive years that they're on. And if they, they uh, meet the criteria all three years, then they will be taken off that list and no more inspections. But during that time, it sounds like uh, you'll be on, you will pay for the inspections on the order of $91 per year for three consecutive years. Well, I apologize, but Ms. Lamanchi won't receive any fees as long as when the county goes out uh, in March to do their inspections and they go by and her property's in compliance, she'll be removed from the list at no cost to her. That's the agreement that we've worked out with uh, the county. Under, understood. So the other gentleman, we'd have to look into his specific situation. And like Mo uh, alluded to, we'd be happy to assist him with uh, the criteria of a specific property. And Mo's inspectors have um, photographic documentation as well as GPS coordinates to, to assist in that evaluation. Understood. So we have council members, council members Becker and then Shahal. Yeah, I, um, I was going to make a motion to close the public hearing. Okay, were there any other members of the public that'd like to speak first? And then, Councilmember Chal, do you have something that's? Uh, yeah, uh, for just for clarification, like uh, when a resident received this notice, and as mentioned by the lady over here, like actually the it was not a weed issue basically. So, what redressal do they have? to counter, let's say somebody complained or something, what redressal they have at the outset to send a letter to fire department or to the county that, oh, this is not it is. It's a different story, basically, so that they don't have to wait for three years to take the property off the list. 
So do you, do you have that process laid out that, okay, if you receive your first letter, within 10 days, within 15 days, if you comply or you show that this was not the case, as mentioned, if somebody complained or something, do they have a redressal? And if that redressal is there, is it well documented on the website of the county or website of the fire department or website of the city of Santa Clara? Yeah, the county has a, a fabulous website. Uh, and again, as I alluded to, all of the properties that, that are here this evening or that are on the commencement list before you were cited last year. Uh, and obviously the county does a, a great job of documenting the situation that they find just in case people come the subsequent year uh, to plead their case. Uh, and as Mo, uh, as I noted earlier, prefers to handle it at the lowest level. So if citizens have concerns, they should talk specifically uh, with Mr. Kumre and his staff regarding their concerns. Uh, as it relates to an appeal, the only people that can take them off the commencement list is Mo himself or you as a council by taking action to remove the individual uh, property owner. Okay, so the council has the authority to remove them Yes. if the resident applies for it to the council, basically. Correct. This is the public hearing for that, that action if the council And sees. then they don't have to pay for the three years of um, inspection fees. Correct. If they, would be, they would not be part, they would be removed from the commencement list and would not be in the program. So if that gentleman who mentioned, I don't know what the circumstances for him are, so he has two redressals. He can go to Mr. Mo and say, hey, this is not the case, or whatever the case is, he can represent to him, or they can come to the council for removal of that. Correct, sir. Thank you. And uh, does the county website, do the resident has to go there in person, or they can do it online, take some pictures? I, what is the, it's just for the, I never got into this situation. I don't even know the, what the contents of the letter are. So what is their redressal, basically? Can they, does the letter specifically say, oh, you can go to the website, these are the one, two, A, B, C, three steps you need to do. Does the letter is self-explanatory to resolve it at the soon as possible, not to wait for three years? Yeah, I'll, I'll refer to, to Mo what the letter says specifically so I don't uh, uh, mistakenly state anything. Thank you. Oh, can you answer that, please? Understood. And we got Mo, Mo on the, uh, the call. I think that you want to say something. Uh, there's two points. One is that the information specifically does tell the property owners they can contact us to get clarification uh, and that they can be referred, they can refer to our website in which they can also send emails through the website uh, for any specific information. Uh, as far as the question about because somebody reported them, uh, we don't add property because it was reported unless we verify that there's actually uh, an issue on the property. So if we were to receive a call from a neighbor saying the guy four houses down has six foot high grass, we would confirm that before we would do anything else with that property owner. Okay, thank you. So are there any other, any other input from the public? And I believe we had a motion from Councilmember Becker to close public hearing. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion second. and a second. Any comments on that? We'll go to Councilmember Jane. Yeah, um, I guess uh, we do have the opportunity here to remove um, this gentleman from the list. I guess I would like to hear from him about his circumstances, about why we can believe that this will not happen on his property again uh, before we close public hearing. Yes, actually. Uh, I, would, I, would I would ask the vice mayor to uh, uh, give me that opportunity to hear from him. Okay. I can speak? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Actually, the only reason why we did not plant the, uh, the front garden because we wanted to save water. And with that, the procedure we were doing in the past, we let it grow the weeds, we used the chemicals because the, the soil is just like we just, we did not plant it except the main trees and some decoration. So we, uh, uh, use chemicals and then that will kill the roots and then once a year we go and wipe all that and remove it. 
This time we got this letter, so we took the action, we removed everything within the next two, three weeks we're planning to use, which we don't like, but we're going to use an artificial decoration, everything else where there's no, we don't need to consume water or anything like that, and we would be taking care of it for good. So, but if you go now and, and see the front of the house, pristine, very clean, we shaved the whole soil, but we were working on the basis of saving water, and that's why we leave it for grow long, spray chemicals, kill the roots, and then pull it out and take out. That way, it clean, keep the soil clean, but maybe they came once and they saw it is high, and that's why we were enlisted. Otherwise, if you go now or any other time, it's not even uh, an issue. Yeah. Okay, Councilmember Becker. Thank you. Yeah, so I think Councilmember Jane was kind of alluding to this already that we have the power to remove somebody from the list, especially if it's, they're able to verify it. So are we able to go and say, okay, let's make a motion and included in our motion, say, adopting this and then we can individually uh, approve individuals and at the same time individually approving okay, so individuals they have to verify afterwards? Un understood. So, so clarity, I'd like to ask the city attorney, like the city, this is a public hearing on an adoption of a resolution. I don't think that we can add the um, removal of uh, someone who has been cited, but what I heard from Mo Kumre is that Mo or the council can remove a resident from the list, and I, can I request that um, Mr. Kumre work with the resident to make that happen, to get that uh, resolved uh, for both, the, not just uh, Ms. Uh, I believe it's Lamashi, Lamashe, um, and the gentleman, the second gentleman as well. That would be my request. I don't think that we can take an action. I think Sue raised her hand. Okay. Uh, uh, Sue? Yes, thank you. Um, actually, Councilmember Park, I, I, I lowered my hand because Councilmember Park hit the nail on the head uh, with his, his comments just now um, that directions of staff to work with the homeowner, uh, the gentleman who has come, it would be the, would the, be the appropriate action. Okay, thank you, thank you, Sue. Because uh, sure. I was reading that letter he said, and it almost looked like we could have done something based on the language, but now I, rethinking it, now it makes a little more sense. So, I mean, I would include that in my motion um, to basically adopt the resolution ordering the abatement of the nuisance consisting, oh, oh, we didn't, oh, I'm so we, sorry. We, we haven't we actually have voted on the, the public hearing. Public. My apologies. So can we go to the vote? to close a public hearing unless there's anyone else from the public who would like to speak. Councilmember Watanabe. Yes. Councilmember Shahal. Yes. Councilmember Hardy. Yes. Vice Mayor Park. Yes. Councilmember Jane. Yes. Councilmember Becker. Yes. That motion passes. So public hearing is closed. And at this point, are there any other, Councilmember Becker, you wanted. Yeah, so I, I was gonna just take the recommendation um, that staff gave, which is adopt a resolution, ordering the abatement of the nuisance consisting of growing weeds in the city, as well as including, um, what I think you just said a moment ago, which is uh, getting yep. staff to work out yeah, uh, I, with the individual. I, I don't know that we'd make that part of the motion. Uh, oh, we we don't? would ask staff to work with the, uh, okay. the the public speakers on the side, but the motion uh, that you so would yeah, have would motion, be to... Motion as is, and I just ask staff to work out with the individuals and hopefully they get off the list. I'll second that. We have a motion a second. Are there any comments? Are there any discussion on the motion? Um, I, I do have some comments if nobody else does. I don't see any here. Um, I mean, I feel that a lot of these issues, like we've heard a number of residents, not just at this meeting, but the previous meeting as well, could have been resolved if we like we gave them some time to fix the citation as uh, the other council members have suggested. Uh, I know that for other problems and some of them, some are bigger like trees or bushes, we basically have a notice that says, we will cite you if you do not clear this by this date or by this time. And they give you a numbers to call and they tell you, this is what you have to do. This is the number that you call so that we can come and inspect it and see that the work has been done. Um, because, I mean, as the, app, as the people who come here say, it's very stressful when you've got a citation from the city. And even more so because this is the first time we've heard of this citation, we know about this citation, 
And you know, it says, maybe very clear, uh, there's a website that you can go to, there's email that you can send, but oh my goodness, the first thing that we're thinking is, I've got this citation, I have no idea what to do with this. Um, and it's costly and annoying, and not just annoying for this one time, but it sounds like it's costly and annoying for the homeowner for the next three years, minimum. And if there happens to be another problem, longer than that. Uh, and I feel that 2022, 2021, a lot of the stuff that, that grew up, it didn't grow probably in 2022, it probably grew in 2021, um, which was during COVID. And I feel that this is the time where everyone's schedules and gardening habits were disrupted. And I, I just heard um, the second uh, person speak, and I think it's very understandable that, well, we've stopped watering our gardens. Uh, we're no longer doing gardening the way that we would have liked to have done gardening during non-COVID times. And our response is, well, what we know, we're gonna let it grow out, and maybe once a year, we're gonna cut it, you know, cut it to root. Um, and it just turns out that if you pick the wrong day to cut it, then you're gonna get cited for this. Um, even though, you know, a week later it may be cut, cut down. And I really hope that we will have, or we'll put in place, I mean, it takes a little bit of time, but I feel like the time saved for giving notice and then checking back after a month, um, it will be well saved in having to check back every year for the next three years. Especially uh, charging people, citing them, um, invoicing them for the inspection fees and doing the inspection. I feel like if we just put a little bit of effort to be in front of this, I'm not, not saying it's the wrong thing to do uh, to cite people, but at the same time, I feel that if we gave people an opportunity to correct the problems before it came to they're put on a list and have to take actions for the next three years, uh, and we have a little bit of understanding that these happened during COVID, like I feel that during COVID, a lot of people took time off, went different places, didn't have, you know, weren't outside gardening the way that they would have, weren't, weren't doing things, couldn't hire gardeners the way that they would have in the, um, in the past. And we would have a little bit of understanding there. I feel like there are a lot more people who are affected by these kinds of citations that we won't hear about because some of them probably just paid and are on the abatement program. Some of them we haven't heard from yet. Uh, that may come here in the future, but I would hope that we can reduce the cost and the effort by the city to give the people a chance to respond to a possible citation before we actually give the citation, right? And I'm not saying that we give them, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure that this is what we'd like to do, and uh, I see that. I, I just wanted to clarify, uh, Vice Mayor Park, is that it's not our city program. We contract uh, since 1976 with Santa Clara County, so it's their framework or their program. We don't have any say, just like the 13 other jurisdictions that participate in the framework of their compliance program. And Mo can get into more specifics if you like to hear that. Uh, Understood, and I think, feel like maybe this item is not the appropriate time, but uh, we, it sounds like there is a, another discussion that we could possibly have with the county on on what we can do, you know, not just during COVID, but now from the learnings we've had from the citations given during COVID, what we can do the future here. And we've got Council Member Chahal. Thank you, Vice Mayor. So I look at the letter. I think we need to make improvements on this letter too, because I don't see any email where the homeowner can contact. I don't see any phone number where the homeowner can contact them. It just says, okay, you have been put in this program and these are, your consequences of that. So there is no remedial action as a first action is provided on this letter. So I think the county has to revise this letter if they want to make it more efficient, not to waste time for their time as well as the residents' time. So I would say the county should look at uh, what letter they are issuing and how they can re address at the outset so that they don't have workload of unnecessary workload and this uh, issue can be resolved. So I fully agree with the Vice Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Park that we need to make this process a little bit more efficient and a little bit more informational so that a resident can take action right away on that. They don't have to come to this meeting for this letter. I don't think it's their time or the council's time worth uh, spending on this one. But if they have something to take care right away from their desk for email, sending a picture or addressing it, that would be really nice. Thank you. Great point, Councilman Chal. And I see that uh, Director Kumare also has his hand up. Uh, 
Yes, I wanted to clarify the letter that the council member just held up. That's not the letter informing the property owner when they when the issue existed. That is the notice of this public hearing. That is the exact framework described in the California Health and Safety Code. That's exactly how it has to be worded. Uh, but they received a letter prior to that that said your property has been non-compliant, been found to be non-compliant, and you will be added to the program. And that letter tells them to contact us with any questions that they have. There are also th uh, three other documents with that notice there that went to the property owners that also give them information on how to contact us and, and what the expectations are for the properties to be maintained. Okay, so I, I was just discussing about this letter. I'm not aware of that. So I take my words back if you have a other detailed letter so I can take my words back on that to improvement on that. Okay. Thank you. And can I ask a clarification? Is that initial letter that you send out, is that notice of a citation or notice of pending citation with steps on what they can do to avoid the citation? We don't have a pending citation. It's not actually a citation. We're informing them that we noticed the property to have been non-compliant and that we intend to add it to the, to the next year's cycle. Uh, the property owners can contact us. Uh, the second speaker, now that we've heard, appears to have removed all hazards from the property, which would probably, if, if that's what actually happened, that would remove the property automatically because it's landscaped to a to a condition that would make it no hazards on the property. They can do those things to prevent being on the program, but then we can't continue to go back and look at properties because we are a cost recovery program. If we look at the properties multiple times, but don't add them to the program, we don't get paid. So we're, we're spending money that we're not recovering. So that's part of the problem. No. Understood. So, I mean, I understand this issue of cost recovery, but at the, um, you know, we want to not pay more than we have to. We want to recover costs where we, we have costs. But at the same time, I would like to see us as also a service to the residents uh, where the residents are not um, inordinately charged for, you know, our programs when they don't have to be. Like, and I understand, uh, Mr. Uh, Director Kumre, that people can come to you and you can cancel those citations as well. And uh, again, there's gonna be people who, you know, aren't going to clear their, their properties, but for the ones that do, uh, I would like to, you know, make it known in the first citation or the, the uh, notice what they can do to clear their property so that we don't get into the uh, three year job of inspecting them again and again and, and again. Um, again, not not against making money, but I don't want to make money uh, on the backs of residents who are trying to live their lives and try to comply. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other comments? Do we have a motion? Okay. Go to roll call vote. Councilmember Watanabe. Yes. Councilmember Shahal. Yes. Councilmember Hardy. Yes. Vice Mayor Park. Yes. Councilmember Jane. Yes. Councilmember Becker. Yes. The motion passes six, um, unanimously. And again, thank you um, for both the fire marshal and for Director Kumre. I know that this is kind of a tough thing for residents, um, but I also know that we can get through this and come up with a, a process that um, not so bad, not so stressful for the residents and still makes sense for the city. Thank you. That takes us to item seven, action on agreement for services with Wilson, Erig, and Associates for noise monitoring system and services for the Levi Stadium. And we have uh, Director Crabtree. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor, members of the City Council. I'm uh, Andrew Crabtree, Director of Community Development, and I have a, a brief uh, presentation here on this uh, contract or agreement uh, that we're asking for council action on tonight. And as noted, this is um, a contract 
an agreement for services with Wilson Erig and Associates for noise monitoring a system and services for a Levi Stadium. As background information, um, in this contract, we, we have been monitoring uh, noise at Levi Stadium through some fixed monitors going back uh, to uh, 2017 that started in August of 2016 when City Council gave us direction to establish a noise monitoring system for Levi Stadium 49ers training facility. Uh, we uh, sent out uh, letters requesting bids from uh, the noise consultants who work in this area and we received three proposals. Uh, based on that, we selected a Wilson Irrigan Associates in 2017 um, and they've been providing uh, noise monitoring services for us since then. Um, and we call them noise consultants. They're technically an acoustical engineer. Uh, they do monitoring analysis related to acoustics, noise, and vibration. M more recently, in uh, March of last year, uh, we were before the council and, rec and did an amendment to the contract that we had with Wilson Erig. And at that time, uh, the city council uh, gave us direction to conduct a new request for proposals or RFP uh, process um, before doing any further extensions of that agreement. So in uh, September of 2022, the city uh, published the RFP for noise monitoring system and services uh, for Levi Stadium uh, through the city's e-procurement system. And we received uh, two responsive proposals, uh, one from Hydro to Geotech and one from Wilson Erig. Those were reviewed by a city manager's office and community development department staff panel and scored using a system that the city uses for um, procurement. And uh, based on experience qualifications, um, the system and fees. So based on that, uh, the city did select uh, Wilson Erig uh, to continue uh, to be the, the consultant from this new RFP system, uh, I'm sorry, RFP process. And that was based on that they had demonstrated that they had significant experience with noise monitoring of events with amplified noise and crowds uh, throughout the, the US, uh, that they had, um, had very notable experience with Chase Arena in San Francisco over a five year period. Um, they have numerous staff in-house that have um, experience and expertise in, in doing the type of analysis and monitoring that we are looking for. And also there's a benefit that they have local staff that can be present for on-site attended monitoring, um, which can be helpful for us. Per the uh, council direction in March of last year, um, the RFP included a request for an option to purchase noise monitoring equipment rather than renting, as we have been doing in the past. However, uh, neither a respondent um, was able to provide a purchase option. And I understand that in, in many cases, um, the sort of the, new, the technology that's available, that sort of the, the firms that produce that technology only make it available on a lease basis. I mean, and it's not generally for sale, the type of equipment that would be uh, most useful for this monitoring. Uh, staff recommends proceeding uh, with the current practice of renting equipment, uh, which offers the city the benefit of receiving the full maintenance um, and support over the term of the agreement. And I can say that in the past, under our rental option, there have been times when there have been um, equipment malfunctions or, or failures, and those have all been addressed and replaced as part of that uh, rental agreement. We currently have four noise monitor locations that are shown here on this exhibit, uh, two to generally to the south of the stadium on Cheney Street, one near Lenox and one near um, a little further south. Um, and then we have two to the east um, on either side of Hughes Elementary School. And those four locations came um, as a result of our first RFP we requested that the consultants who were bidding um, at that time suggest locations. And so um, Wilson Erig, who was selected at the time, uh, recommended initially these four locations 
um, generally speaking, and, and they're tied to uh, existing uh, light poles or other infrastructure that you know can provide a power source. So that's the specific locations. But generally, uh, these four locations came as the consultant's recommendation. Um, over over time, the consultant has commented that we could probably uh, make do with just two of those, and staff generally concurs. Um, the uh, the Hughes Elementary and Cheney and Lennox locations identify as number one and number three on this map. Um, consistently uh, record higher noise levels than the other two um, at 4624 Cheney and um, number four at Avenue de Lago de Avenue de los Arboles um, locations. And, and that makes sense uh, since they're further away um, from the stadium, which is really the noise source that we're focused on. So the uh, contract um, proposed terms are is a five-year contract starting April 1st of this year, ending March 31st, 2028. Uh, the maximum compensation over the five years would be $296,000. And that was based on um, maintaining all four uh, locations and continuing to pay the rent costs for all four. Uh, there is flexibility to modify the number of monitoring stations um, and also the ability to conduct some in-person monitoring um, and prepare reports such as the one that was recently provided to the City Council. Um, and we had positive feedback from the Council that that report was helpful. Um, so um, as part of this, I think staff is recommending that the Council consider directing us just to continue with the two uh, locations um, going forward and that the additional money be set aside and used for to give us the ability to do more in-person monitoring, uh, particularly for concert events, and provide more reports of that that we think can be more useful information. So with that, uh, staff is recommending that the council um, approve, authorize the city manager's office, um, consistent with pro uh, properly delegated authority and so forth, to enter into the agreement with Wilson Erig. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Crabtree. So I've got a lot of speakers here. Uh, Council Member Chain. Yes, thank you, Director Crabtree. Um, you know, recently we had uh, 030 from some re residents complaining about the Coldplay concert. And it seems like only after we received that complaint did we then discover that that concert exceeded? And I'm wondering how, why we don't get automatic reports of exceedances and almost immediate reports so that we could get the feedback back to the, the concert promoter to turn down the levels. And then um, I like the idea of having the two instead of the four simply because the additional two are in line from the stadium. You know, if they were more separated out, not in line with the stadium, then you would maybe expect a different um, reading. But the fact that the sound attenuates as you go further down makes it kind of obvious to me that we don't need those other two. Um, the council recently approved of a stadium neighborhood uh, relations committee. And would Wilson Erig be available at those quarterly meetings as part of this contract uh, to be able to report to, to answer any questions from residents? And then is there any benefit? My understanding is that uh, the maximum sound level at the speakers is 100 dBA, and it should never exceed that. Is there any mechanism to provide monitors inside the stadium to make sure that those levels are not exceeded? Um, because that's kind of the only thing you can control. Because if you have fan noise that, you know, the, the, the spectators, if they're, you know, um, applauding or, or singing along, or I don't know what they're doing, but that could exceed the level and we kind of don't have any control over that. Uh, you know, it could be there's a touchdown or something and then you get these high noise levels. 
So I'm just wondering if there's flexibility in this contract to allow for within the stadium monitoring or immediate feedback or attending these stadium relations meetings. But I like the idea of if, in fact, if that's the recommendation from the experts to reduce it to two. Thank you very much. Councilmember Chahal. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you, Director Crabtree, for the report. So I had the same uh, notion that uh, looks like the monitoring uh, devices at number four and number two are basically redundant because if one and three are ahead of them, uh, and they're almost in the same line, so they are redundant. So basically to remove them makes sense. My question is, if we remove them, what would be the cost of, instead of 296 or five years, what is, what is our cost? That's my first question. Uh, my second question is, uh, the council report did mention something about uh, having a scope of attended monitoring during the concerts. So I want to find out what does that mean, like uh, uh, attended monitoring, what is included in that? If we have that instead of, once we remove the two, um, devices, then we add this thing. What is the scope of that? That's my second question. And uh, Council Member Jane rightly mentioned that uh, the report should be coming to residents as well as, uh, I know you can go and check the monitoring online basically, but it would be good if within a span of 48, 72 hours, the particular report is um, published for public as well as the council so that they can see the report, what we got, type of report we got in the, our last, one of the last meetings, basically. And uh, are there any suggestions, like we have some experience with this um, noise issue for last some time. Are there any ish suggestions with the, uh, Wilson I can provide about the direction of the stage or the direction of the uh, speakers, so that we can improve the quality of life of residents and we can uh, m mitigate the impacts of that. And those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if you have questions for the answers for that now. And I don't know if uh, Council Member Jane was asking about, you know, could we get uh, proactive, preemptive reports after events instead of having to wait for people to complete during, or during events? Yeah, sure. If, if you'd prefer that I answer questions as they come up. Yes, yes please. All right, um, I can do that. So uh, going back to Councilmember Jane's first question, um, so so we have with well, let me just kind of group these together a little bit. Um, we have within as the contract um, already set up about. You know, the, with the four monitors, uh, the rental cost um, over five years is 160,000, and then we have an additional 133,000 over five years that could be used for in-person monitoring and report specific. Um, there's a, a savings of if we drop to two monitors of about eighty thousand dollars. Now we're not automatically paying the full amount of the contract to the consultant. It's really being we're paying their costs. So. Um, this is sort of a, you know, a maximum not to exceed. By dropping from four to two, we would then have an additional 80,000 that we could direct as we see best. You know, so really, um, you know, staff would use that primarily to respond to requests from the council, but our intention at least would be um, for the next few uh, concerts to have, go ahead and have in-person monitoring and generate reports um, from those similar to what you've seen in the past. Um, so that we have a, a lot of more information to kind of continue tracking that issue. Um, as to uh, the, you know, the reports that we brought to you um, in the council uh, took some time to prepare primarily because um, how you convey noise data is, is complicated. <laughs> we were really were working hard at, at making it as un understandable as possible. But as we kind of come to a conclusion on that, um, we can work with the consultant to see how quickly that could get posted. 
um, certainly have no problem making those reports available on, on the website um, for you know, community members who want to review them. So I think we can address that um, with this contract. We certainly have a lot of flexibility. And then the question about the, um, the in-person or in-stadium, I should say, I'm sorry, in-stadium uh, noise monitors, they're, they're there, that the stadium um, <coughs> excuse me, operations staff has access to, um, and they're aware of that. We've been focused on the neighborhood noise levels because that's sort of the, the permit condition and the, the complaint that we've gotten. Um, but the, the noise monitors in the stadium are intended to be used by the, the, um, the sound technicians, those conducting the event, to be aware of the noise levels. Now, now one issue about real-time monitoring, so we saw that the, the exceedances tend to be at the end of the concert when there's some more fireworks or something like that. So at, at that point, it might be too late um, to try to address it real-time. Um, so I think it's more effective to try to to work with the stadium management in advance of an event and make sure those events are designed to stay below the noise levels and that the, the people working in stadium are aware of that. Um, in my experience, crowd noise is not what's causing the issue. It's really amplified sounds and fireworks um, because just you know the, the, the nature of it, the, the, even though it can be very loud in the stadium uh, from the, the crowd noise, um, that sound doesn't carry in the same way as amplified uh, sound does. So that's why our focus has been more on the, the amplified issues. Uh, from, you know, we did monitor uh, football games in the past, and the, the noise peaks generally come from things like the foghorn that is, is played, blown, um, when there's a score, for example. Um, so I think that's why you know, the focus has been on concerts where there's a lot of amplified sound throughout. So um, could the uh, Wilson Erig attend the stadium NRC? Uh, yes, um, we could certainly have them do that as part of this. And again, you know, they've made it clear to us that they are available to do things in person. They could attend those events. Um, they've offered, and we have in the past had them here for a study session. They've offered to do that as well. Um, so those things could be addressed through this um, as well. Think. Oh, and then the last question was, could uh, Wilson Erig give feedback on the, the design of the sound system within the stadium? Um, and we could ask them to do that as well. I know that at the time uh, the stadium was permitted, there was a, a noise consultant who was really a specialist in this area from Texas that, that, that wrote up an analysis and the system was installed, designed installed based on that. Um, and that was all sort of integrated into the, uh, the permit conditions and sort of the expectations around noise levels. Um, but, you know, if, if uh, the council thinks it would be helpful, we could ask uh, Wilson and Eric to review the, the present uh, setup and see if they have any recommendations. <coughs> yeah, and then. Uh, Dr. Crabtree, uh, one thing I think we missed is what is the scope of attended monitoring during the concert? Like, we have two monitors. What would we get if they have in-person attended monitoring? Sure. That's I wanted to find out because we, if we save money, we are trying to put that money into this bucket, basically. So I want to find out what will we get out of that um, attended monitoring and what's the scope of that? Yeah. Well, the, the benefit of the attended monitoring is that the, the human is still superior to the, the machine in this case in terms of being able to identify the source of the noise, um, and, and then account for it. So when you have someone doing attended monitoring, they're making sure that they're specifically recording noise levels related to the event that we're focused on. So if it's the concert, they're making sure that, that they're uh, recording the concert noise levels and, and accounting for airplane noise or noisy vehicles going by, other things that could be um, contributing to the noise levels and giving us more specific data. So that's why so the, shortly, that's why um, attended monitoring is superior to using the noise monitors. We, we did have them go back uh, with the Coldplay concert and ex extrapolate as much data as they could from the uh, monitors that were in place. I mean, you had that in the report along with the, the in-person monitoring data from two uh, subsequent concerts. But generally, it was better for those two. 
um, than it was even with them sort of going back and, and reviewing the data. We have recordings, so they were sort of listening to those recordings and, and trying to, to discern what the, was causing various noise peaks. Um, there is some software involved that, that um, generally is able to account for the airplane overflights, but it's not 100% accurate. And we found that there are some cases where uh, you know, the sound levels are very similar and they blend together and, and the, the uh, noise monitors didn't distinguish. So you know, we wanted to really make it as accurate as possible. Um, generally, we just find it, it's been helpful to have that in-person monitoring. So you know, our intent would be to go ahead and have um, in-person monitoring for the you know, next couple of, of events, at least two or three events at the stadium to, to see how we're continuing to perform. So uh, I agree, like uh, right now the monitors we have, they can easily distinguish between the jet noise and the stadium noise. And those are the two major sources of noise basically in that area during the concerts, like car passing by is not an issue at all. So we can test them out what is the attended monitoring will get us. If it will get us something very substantial, makes sense, okay, we can continue. But if it is not, if the monitors are so good that like they there's not much of the um, additional information we are getting, I don't want to spend money on that one too. That's my point. Thank you. And generally, as I mentioned earlier, our intent would be to follow the, the direction of the council. If the council requests additional monitoring or study or attendance at meetings, we have the capacity to address that in this. Basically, we are getting the data what we need. Basically, we know what the noise levels are. But I wanted to find out what the attended monitoring can get us at the addition right now. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Watanabe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Crabtree, uh, for the report. And I'm really glad that uh, you did a great um, thorough vetting of uh, the two applicants for the RFP and uh, the noise monitoring system. And I'm glad that Wilson Eyrig uh, came out uh, as the winner because they have the most experience and uh, have done a lot of work in the area. So they're very familiar with the north side now. And so uh, I, I think they have a lot of institutional knowledge that will continue to help uh, develop you know, a plan and program to benefit the, the residents. Um, in terms of the amount of uh, monitors, uh, I agree that the two there on like Cheney and, and Lennox, yeah, they are very close together. Um, however, what I would, in, instead of getting rid of all four of them right now and reducing it to two, is it possible to uh, take a look at the area by Lake Santa Clara? because uh, that area through there is like right in line with uh, the noise coming from the stadium. Uh, I've talked to residents over there in Lake Santa Clara who uh, when the U2 concert was ongoing, literally felt like Bono was singing in their living room. And, uh, and if you know where this, this family lived like right up by Agnew and, and the Creek. So it, was, it wasn't like they were right around the corner. So uh, I'd like to, you know, take a look at that possibility if Wilson Eyrig, you know, wants to go out into the area and get an idea of, um, you know, whether or not one of the um, noise monitors could be moved over there, if that's a possibility, instead of uh, just to taking, them, uh, taking two of them out. I agree with about Los Arbeles. I've talked to residents over there. They are not impacted by noise like the folks over there on uh, Lennox and, and Cheney. Um, another possibility, uh, as you were talking, uh, I was wondering about like the future of the north side, for instance. Uh, you have Tasman East and Kylie and Patrick Henry and Freedom Circle. And is it uh, Po is it possible that in the future we might need some noise monitors in those areas as well? Because um, you know, as you were saying, you know, the, the noise you know go, moves in a lot of different directions. So depending depending on which way the wind is blowing, so it's possible that maybe down the line that noise monitors could be used in those um, specific plans uh, that you know will be developed. Um, 
the other thing I, I just wanted to show you, I don't know, because I'm on um, Zoom here. I don't know if you can see this on my phone, where is it? There we go. Uh, this, this came to me from a friend who was at the January 23rd football game. And they were sitting down in the club seats and uh, they, they were actually in our seats because my husband and I were not able to go. And they actually sent me this from their watch. And so they were getting notifications on their watch about how loud it was inside the, the stadium. So whether or not it was the crowd or the foghorn, I don't know, but this showed up on his Apple watch during the game. So um, definitely uh, there's, I think there's a need for noise monitoring within the stadium as well. Um, let me see. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to add uh, in terms of the data from the Coldplay concert. Uh, I'm, I appreciate the fact that you all went to the lengths to get a really thorough report to bring back. Uh, and in response to the 030 that was uh, filed by Anyarag and AJ. Uh, I, I know both of them and I know how upset they were about the concert. I met with them and gave them guidance as to how to um, file the 030 and you know, get some um, insight into what happened uh, with that concert. So uh, it was definitely uh, very helpful and, and, and made a difference. And, and I think we all learned from it as well, which again is why I'm so grateful that these noise monitors have been placed um, in the North side um, to, you know, look, you know, monitor the quality of life. For, for the residents. And so um, I think that was all I had based on your report, but more importantly, I think before uh, we get rid of the four noise monitors, um, take a look at Lake Santa Clara because they are impacted by noise depending on which way the wind is blowing. And the other, uh, possibly the specific plans, you know, that will be developed eventually. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, in terms of figuring out which direction, like, speakers should be set up, you know, to prevent all the noise, mitigate the noise in the neighborhoods. Uh, there was somebody that I spoke to that actually coordinates the Bottle Rock concerts in uh, Napa. And he had said there, uh, you know, the way he sets up uh, for the concerts, that there is a way to um, monitor and set up speakers so that they are, the, the music is directed where it's supposed to be and not impacting, you know, the neighborhoods or, or, or residents. So uh, if you're looking for somebody that could possibly help, if Wilson Eyrig doesn't have that specialty, I would suggest uh, reaching out to the Bottle Rock um, uh, concert promoters to see what they do in terms of setting up their uh, sound system and, and mitigating noise. Uh, so I, I think that's all I have for now, but thank you again for the report. It was, it was, it was good, good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. So I, uh, just to respond to that a little bit, um, my recommend, since there is a cost associated with installing uh, a mon noise monitor, uh, my rec and and the contract is proposed gives us the flexibility over the five year term to remove or add uh, locations. Um, I think the most effective thing to do would be to have in person monitoring um, at the location um, that you mentioned or other locations are we know to be sensitive, so that we can really understand um, at the sort of the best level what the uh, the impact might be at that at those locations. Um, Tasman East, um, Freedom Circle, and Kylie. Freedom Circle and Kylie are, are, are several years away. Um, Tasman East is under construction now, so um, you know maybe in a couple of years we could be out there as well, um, sort of assessing that situation as it become. You know, I know there are some residents moving into that area already, um, so we you know we, we'll monitor that. But in general, my, my response would be to use the, uh, our ability to do in-person monitoring under this contract to do an assessment of that area and then um, ultimately, based on that information, decide if it warrants having a, a more permanent monitor installed. And just a comment as well. Um, 
the the stadium itself helps to mitigate a lot of the noise that's in the con in the venue so it certainly can be very loud inside the stadium our permit conditions really focus on the impact of the stadium to the surrounding neighborhood so so really not as concerned with how loud the crowd might be at the game event if you attend it um, you probably uh, should be aware that you're exposing yourself to loud, loud sounds. Um, I think the you know, football games, they, they take pride in how loud the crowd can be sometimes um, from what I've gathered. Um, but in any case, um, you know, our, our focus is more on the neighborhoods and making sure they meet the, the sound level, which is considerably lower at uh, 60 uh, decibels dBA over an hour long period than they would be um, interior where they can be, you know, I think around 100 or, or higher sometimes. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Council Member Becker. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, thank you, Andrew, for your report. Um, basically, <laughs> Council Member Jane, Council Member uh, Chahal, and Council Member uh, Watnabe basically covered a lot of what I wanted to ask her and basically get into. So thank you guys for getting there. Um, I agree, you know. Some pinpoints that I really kind of uh, appreciate Councilmember Watnabe bringing up, which is about future spots, you know, which I thought about too in the Tasman area. Um, so I'm glad she brought that up in, in expanding our noise monitors into that area. As well as, uh, funny, she did bring up Lake Santa Clara. Uh, when I walked those neighborhoods during the fall, a lot of neighborhood neighbors in that area, either it was they don't care about the noise or they do care about the noise, but most of the people that were talking about it was on Lakeshore Drive through that whole area from the stadium all the way down. So um, it, it's, a, it's a pretty good distance, but I think as many people said that there is a thing called wind, which does help sound carry. So I would like to get maybe a little more info on that to understand what they, they're going through as well. Um, as for noise, I know uh, inside, it's gonna be really hard to monitor or control noise inside because uh, I know for sure that like for the Seahawks game and the Cowboys game, those are two playoff games. And they literally put on screens, I know for sure, when I went to a game two years ago, they encourage crowd noise. They say, get loud, get louder. I mean, you go to Seattle Stadium, I mean, you can't even hear yourself think. Um, so I know that they do encourage it and they want it to be loud as possible because they want to break the sound. I mean, I think the Chiefs Stadium has, holds that record right now and I don't think we really want to hold that record, but we do want to have an environment where we are competitive. Uh, so I don't want to go and put any kind of restraints on that um, considering what's inside the stadium and games are already played. And I do like uh, appreciate how you considered the, the bowl shape of where the sound can't carry. Um, but you basically covered everything that I wanted to ask. Uh, Councilmember Watnabe, Councilmember Chahal, Councilmember Jane hit many of the points, so I won't repeat them. Uh, but I'm all for keeping these noise, mo noise monitors going. Um, it's the only thing that's actually keeping some checks and balances going on in that area. So um, I'm ready to make a motion to approve staff's recommendation. Oh, okay, but we also have uh, Councilmember Hardy. I've been patient, <laughs> thank you. Um, having lived in that area, right around the corner from Catherine Hughes Elementary, very familiar with us. And when we talked with the neighbors when the stadium was conceived of, that was part of what we were concerned, is the noise that would bother the neighbors. My attitude is, if you're in the stadium, you chose to be there. And so, of course, the sound is going to be over 100 decibels many, many times. I actually have my own decibel meter and measure students when they do their yells um, on campus in the quad, and often they get over 103. So it, but it's the duration of the time, and the OSHA standards are anything over 90 decibels for eight hours is when you have to have um, some, some kind of ear protection for, to make certain you don't have damage over long periods of time. But our numbers are much lower than that, and this is for neighbors. I like the idea that they're a thousand feet from each, in each direction. Because you're absolutely right, there's different, there's different winds, but having one east and one south makes sense because that's where the neighbors are and that's why we have the information. That's what it's for, to monitor what kind of impact the, the concerts and games are having. 
that's, that's, it's just information. I will tell you that I know from having gone over the voting, Measure J did not pass in those areas because I think the neighbors were concerned. And we noticed the voting patterns is that the further away from the stadium you lived, the more likely you were to vote for it. The problem is we have a stadium, we have to make it work, and this is part of our reality. If I remember right, the sounds are averaged over an hour. So it's only if we have something for a sustained period of time over, the, over our threshold. We all know that the airplanes are much more noisier. They're, when you look at the reports, it shows very large blips. From having lived out there, I know that the airplanes are the noisiest thing. That's the reality. So I'm glad that we have a way to take that out and put it back in as far as when we look at our, what, how our stadium is impacting our neighborhoods. I think two monitors makes so much sense, having them about, I think it was 1,085 feet from the stadium in both directions. I see no reason to have more because if anyone understands sound, it will dissipate as it gets further. And that's a reality. It's, it's a logarithmic scale based on the, the decibels. It's the intensity of the sound and it goes down measurably the further you get away from that, from the source. So I don't have any problem with that. In fact, I appreciate the fact that we built into this some flexibility because I think that will help. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We have Councilmember Jane. Yeah, so <clears throat> we've authorized uh, five uh, weeknight concerts, and they, as I understand, they have to apply to the city. I know that when the Rolling Stones were playing, they, they had an application where they applied for pyrotechnics and such. Do we have any sense or do we have any control over which uh, fireworks they use? Like, can we eliminate cherry bombs and use flickers instead? Can, do we have any control over that in the use permit? So, so the uh, fire department um, issues permits for each event uh, on the fireworks display. So they regulate that, and uh, my understanding is they do have a fair amount of discretion in what they and how they regulate that. Um, but I can't speak to the specifics of it. Okay, it just seemed like even looking at the cold play, the the sound was exceeded due to the fireworks. And if we can limit the fireworks, then we could actually get below our um, EIR levels. Uh, so, and as I mentioned earlier to, uh, at the prior meeting, our, our intent is to work with the stadium management to help them understand what the limit is that, and ask them to work with the, you know, each concert that comes in has their own uh, operational team. They have their own sound technicians, you know, each, each uh, performer travels with their own um, staff. And the, uh, the stadium manager sort of acts as our representative in, in the interactions with those um, Performers and their and their uh, technical crews. So it's it's through that relationship that we can say, you know, let's design the the show, the performance, to fit within the city's regulations. I think I think that's the most effective approach. Thank you very much. Uh, I also have a couple of comments. I mean, I've heard that uh, stadium stadium sounds are are loud, and I agree. It's a concert. I also agree with Councilmember Hardy's uh, assertion that, well, the people inside the stadium are really worried about them because they chose to be there. And it's really the people that are living around the stadium that we need to worry about. And I think that you've also stated that, which is we're concerned about the noise in the neighborhoods because that's where the complaints come from and that's where um, we really hit the effect of the noise. Um, I also know that Councilmember Jane asked for noise monitoring inside the stadium near speakers. And I think that one of the reasons that that's the metric he chose is because that's 
one of the, what's one of the uh, readings that we have a limit on. We know what the limit should be. Um, and like, regardless of all the other things, that's something that we, we do have a limit on. Um, I hear about wind carrying sound, and I just want to note that um, wind carries differently on hot days as, you know, compared to colder days. Um, I would like to know if the promoters, if concert promoters have to get their fireworks plans approved. Um, not just, well, you will stay within this, but if I, I'd like to know, and I, I know it's not you that can answer this question, but I would like to know if they have to make a list, like a schedule of these are the fireworks they have, and these are the, the, uh, the effects, the, the sounds, the durations, et cetera, of, of the fireworks. Uh, I also know that data is just data, and monitoring is just monitoring, and what we really want from data, and what we really want from monitoring is changes. Like, we would like the monitoring to affect how we have concerts, how we do things in the future to avoid the problems that we're currently, that people are currently hearing, experiencing, and then change them. Uh, and I don't really hear about the changes that we're making. I, I hear about the one-off incidents where people are saying the noise has been exceeded. Uh, we've got a lot of complaints there, but what I'd really like to hear is not just what those complaints are, but what are we doing to try to um, mitigate the problems that we know about? Like, how do we prevent, like, we know what caused this, this noise spike, or we know what caused this problem, and this is what we're doing to address that for future concerts or future events. Uh, I don't really, really get that too much. Um, I also know that we have a lot of data, and I checked a couple of dates in March and April of 2020. And I know that we have like no events during those days and we've got, we have hours that exceed 60 dBA, even with jet filtering on. And I think that we need to look at why this is happening. Like there are, there are noises, jets are not, don't stop when there's a concert. Jets don't stop when there's a, an event. Um, but I, I do know that when we look at the data that we do have noise levels exceeded even with no events, and I'd, I'd like to know why or, you know, how that, you know, factors into what we're looking at. Um, I know that the recommendation we made almost a year ago was that we not only um, extend the contracts for a year and look for, you know, alternative vendors, but it was also to come back with a report on noise monitoring alternatives and noise abatement. And I think the piece that's missing is we've got the data, We've got monitoring, we can increase the monitoring, we've got, but when monitoring shows us that we've got a problem um, and we can identify that problem, what changes are we making to make sure that we don't have that particular problem again? I think that's kind of the gist of what a lot of council members are asking about. Um, I see that we've got Jeremy Ray from FIRE online. Uh, hi, thank you, Vice Mayor Park. Uh, just to address the question, so, in the city's noise ordinance, uh, fireworks with an approved permit are one of the exceptions to the noise ordinance. Uh, the process of getting an approved permit for a concert uh, does generally include uh, the run of show. So I know there was a reference made to the Rolling Stones concert where there was a change required that the pyrotechnician was uh, basically required to change to flickers only as opposed to fireworks. And that was because the run of show showed that uh, they were going to use pyro for one particular song, Sympathy for the Devil, that was going to play at about 945. And then they intended to use pyro for the encore. Uh, a condition of the permit was basically that they were not going to be able to use pyro for the encore uh, because of the, the lateness of the hour that that would be. Uh, it was basically already in the, in the run of show that it would go beyond the, the 10 p.m. curfew. Uh, so that was a condition of the fireworks permit. Uh, in general, um, we are not looking at the noise or the decibel level of fireworks. We're looking at the safety of the show that the pyrotechnician is licensed in California, uh, the general requirements for safety of a fireworks show. Um, you know, it, it, if there was a, a need to change uh, the noise ordinance uh, in the city code, that, that could be done, um, or we, you know, can can change the process for getting uh, a fireworks permit approved potentially in the future. Um, but that's the, that's where it stands right now. Let me wade in too on, on that question as well as the several others that you um, asked. And, and again, you know, our, our goal here is with 
um, the opportunity to have in-person monitoring for upcoming concerts to see if our you know, efforts to work with the stadium management are being effective to keep the, the, the concerts under the noise level. And as we you know, saw in the last um, report, the, the Coldplay concert did exceed it. The um, weekend was around the noise level, close, very close, and then Elton John was below. So you know, we understand that there are, um, you know, there are differences in noise levels. I mean, there are different types of music and so forth as well. Um, represented there, but um, in working with the sound technicians for the concert event, we think we have the most opportunity to, to you know, look at the run of show, look at when the fireworks will be. Um, generally, they, they, I understand from our noise consultant that concerts are typically louder at the beginning and at the end to you know, get people's attention at the beginning, to create a little bit more excitement at the end, um, and, and they can then control those volume levels. So I think if we work with them, explain you know, clearly what the objective is, we, we should be able to address that. And I think that's the most um, effective approach. But we can go ahead and do that monitoring to see if it's being effective and report back um, and, and make adjustments as necessary. So that is our, our goal, is to achieve compliance with the permit. Um, the permit condition does set the standards, um, and we, we follow those. Um, in terms of other um, noise levels in the neighborhood, one thing the monitors that we have out there do is record any um, single noise event that exceeds a certain decibel level, the, the louder events. So if you see a, an hour where it, the noise level appears higher, you can go into the online portal and you'll see a little sort of recording symbol. If you click in a timestamp, it'll say you know 6.02 or 6.07 and so forth, and you can click on each of those and listen to them. Um, and I've done that a few times to try to understand exactly that question, like why is it loud at this time? Um, and you know, things I've heard are leaf blowers, um, you know, sort of trucks unloading. You know, it sounds like yard work going on. Um, I'm a loud motorcycle going by in some instances. Um, it is possible, you know, if someone were to stop and have a conversation directly below one of our noise monitors, um, you know, the the volume of a conversation can be over 60 decibels um, easily. Um, so, so there are different things. Um, and it's a, a pressure result. So, you know, I give it like a bird were to land on the, the, the microphone, um, that could cause a spike. Uh, there, there's really a lot of different things. And, and again, this is sort of the advantage of having in-person monitoring is you can uh, sift through a lot of that. Just kind of an interesting observation too, we saw you know, at the beginning of, of all the COVID things, noise levels dropped quite a bit. Um, if you went out there and looked at the recordings, and, and that's just commute traffic. Um, people driving by, they're not individually that loud normally, but just the cumulative effect uh, of vehicle traffic also causes um, ambient noise. Thank you very much. And we have Councilmember Watanabe. Well, I had I lowered my hand, but I just wanted to add on to what um, Jeremy Jeremy Ray uh, stated about the uh, the permits, and and I know uh, former city manager Deanna Santana was very um, uh, knowledgeable about the permitting process, and uh, one thing that to, uh, just to add to that, I mean Jeremy touched on on all the important points, but I wanted to just add weather. Weather really makes a big difference too in terms of whether or not you know, something that was uh, suggested for a show or, or during the show, uh, whether or not it's going to happen. And so, um, so I just wanted to add that as well, that weather does make a big difference. So not just, not just wind, it's all aspects of weather. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Councilmember Becker. Thank you. Um, I have no other further questions. I don't think anyone else has any other, but um, I'd like to make a motion to take staff's recommendation, alternative number one. Second. We have a motion for a staff recommendation. Should, should we one. read what alternative one for the public is? Sure, I'll read it out loud. So for alternative one, approve and authorize the city manager's office consistent with properly delegated authority or existing policy to execute an agreement with Wilson Erig for noise monitoring system and services for the Levi Stadium, including the use of two fixed monitoring sites for a five-year term starting on April 1st, 
2023 and ending March 31st, 2028 for a total maximum compensation amount not to exceed $296,000 subject to Santa Clara Stadium Authority appropriation of funds. Thank you. And we have a motion and a second. I believe that was a motion made by Councilmember Becker, seconded by Councilmember Hardy. Is there, any, is there any discussion on the motion? Thank you very much, Director Crabtree. Let's go to the roll call vote. Okay. Councilmember Watanabe? Yes. Councilmember Shahal? Yes. Councilmember Hardy? Yes. Vice Mayor Park? Yes. Councilmember Jane? Yes. Councilmember Becker? Yes. That passes unanimously, which takes us to the end of our uh, general business. Um, written petition has been taken off the agenda and we have reports of members and special committees. Does anyone have any reports? Council Member Watanabe has her hand up. I see. Um, Council Member Watanabe. Thank you. Yes, uh, since I was not able to attend the last meeting, I wasn't able to give a report regarding my uh, visit to Sacramento with three great members of our Silicon Valley power team, uh, including Basil Wong, Alan Curatori, and uh, Kathleen Hughes. Uh, I actually attended the event uh, in uh, place of Council Member Jane, who was sick, and uh, spent uh, all of Monday, February 6th, meeting with representatives of the legislature, uh, both Senate and Assembly, uh, talking about a lot of important things that are impacting not just our area, but the country, and focusing on uh, um, the, uh, the grid, expanding the grid, the affordability, uh, gas, the increases that a lot of people are seeing right now and what the impacts that it's having on uh, residents' budgets, you know, what we can do to work together uh, with our legislature as well as the federal government in terms of bringing those costs down and just a, a whole host of important issues that impact our daily lives. And uh, of course, uh, you know, the... Um, excuse my dog, uh, you know, the important things, uh, you know, like water and, and even the effect uh, that it also has, you know, on our production of electricity through the turbines and the dams. So it, it was a great opportunity to just talk about Silicon Valley power. Our staff is just so phenomenal in terms of the knowledge that they bring to the table and, and it, you're just so proud of them uh, to uh, see how they represent our city and also NCPA. This was actually through NCPA, the Northern California Power Agency, uh, to um, again advocate on behalf of uh, you know these important issues that affect us locally, uh, statewide, as well as nationally. Um, and we did also spend some time with uh, our new assemblyman, uh, Evan Lowe, and also uh, Senate, uh, Senator uh, Aisha Wahab, uh, and give them an update of what Santa Clara is doing in terms of electricity uh, as well. Uh, one thing we found out is that uh, for in NCPA, uh, we do not have an assembly member from any of the 15 representative cities um, uh, representing uh, uh, on any of the, um, the electric um, uh, committees that would, um, uh, you know, give help give, get more advocacy on behalf of uh, NCPA. So it's uh, something we realize that we need to work on. So, uh, so it was really an, an honor to represent the city and uh, spend the day with our staff and also uh, learn a lot. It's also a great opportunity to learn and, uh, and then come back to Santa Clara and break my arm the next day. So I don't know, you just never know from day to day what's gonna happen. So, but anyway, it was a great honor to be there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Councilmember Becker. Thank you, Vice Mayor. 
Um, I've been getting a few text messages, a lot from, from our residents, also from my husband about uh, the power. I guess the power is still out in the southern part of the city. Uh, so I'm pretty sure I think uh, Manuel will probably be covering that in the next section, but uh, I just wanted to inform, because we're going to probably get that answered, that we've been getting a lot of uh, messages about the power. So I guess it's pretty widespread, uh, considering we still have power here at City Hall. Thank you. And Councilmember Hardy. Well, the students will be so sad because they always want to have school canceled because the power's out, but there's no school this week in the Santa Clara Unified. So I can see that they would be very upset that they missed out because we have such good power here and uh, it goes out so seldom. Uh, what I wanted to report back is my position now on the commission for Valley Water is the chair and the water district is looking at putting together a joint powers authority to help with the unhoused situation that we have all experienced and been concerned about. For right now, the reality is we have four creeks that run through our city that Valley Water has jurisdiction for. We have um, our own parks, we have our own situations, and then we have our the county has all the different expressways. And so, and we have jurisdiction realities. What we're looking at is putting together a joint powers authority because the Valley Water has land and some resources. We have more of the enforcement and the county has the mental health services. And the thinking is, that instead of letting people play one jurisdiction against the other when they have limitations in resources and uh, jurisdictions, that we uh, erase some of those lines and work together so that we can help more of the people who are not um, housed at this point and see what we can do to help. So that will be coming down the pike and I wanted to let the rest of the council know. Thank you very much for that. I actually look forward to having more uh, people getting involved and more solutions to the problems that are affecting us and working together. Uh, I also went to a Cal Cities event where it, we did, we did uh, again promote that it's going to be cities working together that are going to solve the regional issues. Uh, no city on its own is going to solve an issue and if we're not committed to you know, the homeless problem, the unhoused, to mental health, um, then we're, we're not gonna get it solved. So I really appreciated that. Uh, listening to Councilmember Hardy, I just remember a long time ago in engineering, it was said that you wanna cause a problem, um, like you stop coffee, and I can just imagine the future, it will be the Wi-Fi is down. Um, not just power, the Wi-Fi is down. So thank you very much for that. Then we have city manager, executive director reports, update on the city council and stadium authority staff referrals. And we have city manager, well, assistant Manuel Pineda here. Um, thank you, vice mayor. Uh, good evening, members of the council. I uh, just wanted to give you a, a quick update uh, on a few things. First, I do wanna note that I did send you emails from a couple of referrals from the last council meeting. So those should be in your inbox. And if you have any questions on that, please please uh, send me a follow-up and we can follow up as well. Um, just wanted to touch base quickly on the, the windstorm that we had today, uh, which uh, was, was significant and we were aware it was coming, came a little earlier than we expected. Um, we'll get you a full report tomorrow, I think when everybody has an opportunity to uh, catch their breath as they're gonna be working tonight, uh, many people will. So uh, just a quick summary, just want to let you know that uh, we did have to close the cemetery today just because the wind was so strong and we had some uh, tree damage that looked Location. We also had to close Central Library because it lost power uh, at some point in the afternoon. Uh, the Department of Public Works got approximately 50 tree calls today and they're aware of some uh, tree failures that we had at certain locations. They're gonna be working on those and we'll get you an updated number. And from a power perspective, it's been a very significant day throughout the Bay Area. I think last time I checked an article, um, I think it said uh, over 110,000 PG&E customers in the Bay Area had lost power. I can't verify that, it was a newspaper. 
uh, we, we lost uh, power um, to thousands of customers as well. Uh, we're, we're still working on that. And I uh, just want to make you aware that uh, the crews are going to be working uh, till very late tonight. Uh, we're working on the large outages first and have returned a few of the large ones. Uh, some of them will take a long time, and we're trying to get power as, much, as quickly as, uh, as we can. You know, we do have some, falling, uh, some power poles that had fallen or in danger of falling, so we um, took the power out, <laughs> de-energized them, and then we also have some tree failures that have uh, taken some wires out. So uh, you will hear this to the night. I expect that some outages will go to the night, but let me assure you that um, uh, the crews are out there working, and I, I really appreciate uh, the tough work on hard conditions. And as soon as we can, uh, tomorrow um, we'll send you an update uh, with some better data uh, as soon as we can get it. So that's just wanted to provide that summary for you tonight because I am sure, as you mentioned, you will, you will hear about it uh, today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. And that takes us to our adjournment. Do I have a motion to adjourn? All motion. Second. Motion and second. Council Member, Board Member Watanabe? Yes. Council Member, Board Member Shahal? Yes. Council Member, Board Member Hardy? Yes. Vice Mayor, Vice Chair Park? Yes. Council Member, Board Member Jane? Yes. Council Member, Board Member Becker? Yes. Thank you. That's unanimous. And that takes us to our next regular meet a scheduled meeting is on Tuesday at the 7th of March, right here. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.